All right, hello everyone, I'm Summer Bach, and this is Susan Pierce Thompson. I'm so excited to introduce her. She is an amazing weight loss guru. I don't know if you go by that, but I think of you as a weight loss guru, and I wanted to give people an opportunity to learn more about your really unique approach and amazing program that you have. Um, but first and foremost, I just wanted to hear a little bit about you and, and how you started out in this whole world. Yeah, sure. I, I don't think of myself as a weight loss guru. Um, I think of myself as a psychology professor, actually. That's, that's my background. Um, tenured psychology professor. I recently handed back tenure, which was a very scary thing to do, having taught at colleges and universities around the world full-time for 13 years. Um, and of course, getting tenure is a long thing. Um, but one of the things that I taught at the college level was um, a course on the psychology of eating. And I, I ended up teaching that because um, I myself have a long background of struggling with my weight and I'm someone who's sort of constitutionally predisposed to weight gain. Um, and I also have a brain that's very susceptible to addictions. We talk about sort of having an addictive personality or whatever. I'm definitely one of those people. And as a teenager, it got quite bad for me with drugs. I ended up dropping out of high school and having kind of a rough go, you know, of my own making, admittedly, um, as a teenager and um, sort of dropped out of high school, scraped along the bottom for a while, did obviously pull it together and went to community college, went to a four-year school, did a postdoc, got my PhD, all that stuff happened afterwards, after I got clean and sober when I was 20. Um, but food addiction basically took the place of drug addiction in my life. And um, so between my body's sort of constitutional um, tendency to, to store weight as opposed to, you know, stay lean naturally, um, and, and my food addiction, I sort of could never live in a body that felt comfortable to me. And um, so I was constantly on the you know, on the circuit, trying to run a marathon, trying to join a gym and get healthy, trying to, you know, read the latest science on, you know, how to eat right, whatever. It just, nothing ever really worked. And ultimately in 2003, I did finally find a method of eating that worked for me. And that led me to, um, studying the neuroscience of food addiction, essentially. And in my college course on the psychology of eating, I included a really meaty unit on the neuroscience of food addiction and how food works in the brain. And I just um, went on sort of a long journey of making that my expertise, doing a lot of research in that area, teaching that college course. And then also in my sort of private life, I was um, coaching um, thousands of people over the years, how to lose weight and keep it off. And What's happened now is, um, well, I, th I think we're going to talk about that and stuff, but, um, you know, there's reasons why people have such a hard time losing weight. It's, um, it's one of the things that I think our society is not having a very clear conversation about is what's really up with all the people who are struggling to lose weight. It's kind of a, it's kind of a mysterious thing. I think everybody is happy to sell to those people like, oh, buy this supplement, buy this gym membership, buy this whatever, but but the reality that it's not working for anybody, I think, is actually a more interesting intellectual and scientific conversation than most people are having these days. So I like to have that conversation. That's what that's kind of what I do. Yeah, I, I love that. And so what's interesting to me, first of all, I just want to say about your story is I had a similar thing go on. We have actually a very similar story, you know, drug use in my late teens, mm -hmm. uh, you know, drug use summer, really? Yeah, it was, it, I mean, it was intense, I will say, very, very intense. And I um, actually was able to get clean on my own from opiates. And it was, I just, yeah, it was a really, I mean, I, I, did, I figured out how to do it by myself, which is also a little bit, there, it leads to its own challenges. And so it's interesting because I think my story is similar. Food addiction and addictive things in general, it's like my body is patterned toward that as a, um, it seems like a natural solution for <laughs> overwhelm, a natural solution for fear or emotions or whatever, you know, so I can definitely relate to that. So it's, it's interesting. I, I didn't realize that about us, but very cool. I, I think that'll be great. Um, actually. So just being able to have further conversations with you about that, to be yeah, honest. I'm totally, yeah. 
totally curious now. I totally didn't do it alone. I did. I went to a 12 step program. I didn't do rehab. A lot of people do rehab. I, I just went to a 12 step program and that worked for me, but I, I can't imagine having done it by myself. So God hats off to you. Thanks. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your approach in that way. I'm curious. So my approach is it was designed for people whose brains are more predisposed to addiction. And, um, I think a lot of people who have skirted the drug and alcohol addiction might not realize that they have a brain that's more susceptible to addiction because they've actually just been using food all along and they don't think of it as a drug. So they don't think of themselves as addicts. But I have a quiz um, that people can take as five questions and it helps them to know how susceptible their brain is to the addictive pull of food, which is different than the addictive pull of nicotine or drugs or alcohol or whatever. So um, with that information on board, my program looks at using bright lines for food as opposed to approaches of moderation. So it's one of the things that I think our society is um, fuzzy thinking about is we know, we know that we know that we know now that sugar and flour are very addictive. They they act on the same dopaminergic reward systems as cocaine and heroin in the same way. We've got a lot of brain imaging evidence on this. We've got a lot of rat data on this. We've got a lot of human data on this. The data are very strong. And um, with that knowledge, it's interesting to me that so many people are still trying the experiment of just one piece of pizza, just one cookie. And in my experience, it's much easier to not eat any cookies, not eat any pizza, um, and tough it out for those, you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes of like, no, thank you, than to try engaging with the beast and wrestling with it. And will I, won't I, have I had enough? Have I not had enough? You know, all that stuff. So a bright line is helpful. And a bright line is just a clear unambiguous boundary that you just don't cross. Like if you're going to quit smoking, I think almost everyone imagines putting up a bright line for cigarettes, for nicotine. Like you're just not going to smoke no matter what. And that makes a lot of sense to people because they think of themselves as engaging with a drug. And that if you've been a heavy smoker and you're really wanting to get healthy, a bright line for cigarettes is the way to go. Um, and I propose that um, we need bright lines for sugar and flour, a lot of us too. Um, and a lot of people say that, you know, that's extreme or that's setting you up for failure. And I say, well, you know, almost 70% of Americans are overweight or obese. Like that's extreme. You know, 80,000 people are walking into a leg or a foot amputation this year and they can't stop eating sugar. They've got type two diabetes. Their doctors told them, I'm going to cut off your leg if you don't stop eating like this. And they can't stop. I say, that's extreme. Like we need, we need a different approach. A lot of people are just not able to meet their goals, live in a right size body, get healthy, whatever their goals are, like keeping all four of their limbs, you know, with the approaches that are available right now. So we use just a different approach. We use bright lines. Bright lines. So that's what bright line eating, right? That's their, the name of your company. Bright line eating. Yep. I love that. That is so fascinating. And <laughs> you're right, it is extreme uh, to be getting a limb cut off. And I, I've known people who have had to go through that um, and, you know, were drinking day of surgery and they shouldn't have been, you know? It's so intense. It's, you're right, there's some addiction there. Whether it's, I mean, and I think of alcohol as sugar. Alcohol is sugar. I think of it as sugar too. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's worse than sugar. It's sugar with an ethanol compound on it that gives, makes you intoxicated, which reduces your inhibitions for eating more sugar right after. So um, it's like, it's like a candy bar with a side of uh, like, like reduced willpower so that you're going to eat more after. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> so do you, I, I guess what I'm really curious about, because I think, I think this is all really interesting approach is there a, how do you work through the feelings of deprivation that people might come up against? Yeah. Same way as if you're quitting smoking. So, you know, it's, it's all right. Yeah. It's going to be hard, especially at first. And when you keep that line bright, it's going to get easier and easier and easier. So there's some amount of toughing it out. There's some amount of get yourself support. There's some amount of like, get yourself mentally strong because it's the wishy-washiness that makes it hard. You know, when, you're, when your line is bright and you're just like, mm, I'm just doing this, then it's a lot easier. So um, we have a very supportive community and we have a fully fleshed out program that helps people, you know, um, sort of basically keeps them engaged and, and helps them set up their life. Um, there's a lot of life structures that help 
with a bright line eating approach. Um, we focus on making our eating as automatic as brushing our teeth because willpower is going to come up. If you just decide I'm not going to eat sugar and flour, there's going to be that Friday night where it's been a long week and you've just sat through traffic and your kids are nagging at you and it's like, honey, we got to order out. And it's just all of a sudden you're eating something off your plan. And to, to combat that, it doesn't take more dedication or, um, you know, you don't have to like be a better person. What, what it really takes to overcome that is planning in advance. So if you've written down your food the night before and you've planned out what it is and dinner's maybe even half prepped, it's in the fridge and you just got to throw a few things together, you, and, and maybe even you've committed your food to somebody. So you've maybe posted in our online community or you've texted a buddy and said, what I'm having for dinner tomorrow night is, now all of a sudden you hit that Friday night and you have in your brain some pre-wiring for what you're actually doing for dinner that night. And so when you're like, oh, we just got to eat, you just start grabbing the ingredients and start throwing it together. So it's, it's about making the, the right thing to eat the easiest thing to eat, essentially, in any given moment. And it takes um, some habits and rituals of pre-planning and pre-commitment. Um, so our program teaches people how to do that so that eating becomes really sort of automatic. It's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but any plan of really healthy, vibrant, life-affirming eating is going to be swimming upstream in today's culture. So you're going to need some tools of support and planning and automaticity to keep that dialed in day after day. I'm just so excited about this. I have this vision of a culture where more and more and more people start paying more attention to how they're eating and, and actually eating um, in a way that's supportive for their health, their family's health. Once there is enough people doing that, the culture shifts. There is a tipping point where it gets easier to do those things within the culture. So I love your, it's like swimming upstream. Uh, you know, all of us swimming upstream right now are going to actually eventually bring everyone into the ocean together. We can all hang out on some floats and we can all party on some boats and we'll all be, you know, with our shots of juice and our like really good food. I totally agree, Summer. I think we're part of a food revolution that's happening. You know, there's the food revolution network and, you know, I'm noticing in my grocery store now, they're changing my local grocery store because so many people are buying organic food now. They used to have it sequestered in this little section of the grocery store, but um, people who are looking for salsa in the regular salsa aisle also wanted to buy organic salsa. So they had it in two places in the store and they finally just realized, let's not have the little health food section because organic is not even special anymore. It's not even health food anymore. Let's just keep the organic salsa with the salsa. And it's like a mental shift. Like you're saying, you know, um, eating well has become mainstream enough that, that society as a whole is changing. And it's very interesting to watch. I, I mean, I, I come at this from the individual. My mission is that that person who was me 13 years ago, on the floor, obese, praying, crying, journaling, God, there's got to be a solution for this. I've tried everything. I cannot show up to this life in this body. I can't face one more morning where I can't tie my shoes. There's got to be a solution for this. Wow. The person who's, who's praying that prayer, that's who I wake up for in the morning. Wow. But it was neat to see that as these thousands of lives have changed, I mean, over the last two years, we've helped people in 63 countries lose 133,000 pounds. And as, as those people are buying you know, vegetables instead of donuts, right? We are helping progress the food revolution and that sort of societal sea change that you're talking about that you're a part of too, you know, like helping people with their gut health and helping people learn how to ferment vegetables. It's just a, you know, all, we're all like these bricks in the wall serving the people that we serve. And absolutely we need, you know, the way our, our society handles food is profoundly disordered and sick. And, um, you know, sort of staying numb to that, you just kind of float downstream into cancer, obesity, diabetes, and, you know, and I know that your tribe is well on board with that. Nobody's thinking about learning how to home ferment vegetables if they're not already on board with the food revolution, you know, in some way, shape, or form, right? So I know I'm preaching to the choir here a little bit, but it's exciting to see those individual changes make such a big societal impact. It's exciting, but, you know, I mean, for me, it's also really helpful to hear what you're focusing on and you as a resource, because you do have a unique approach, you know, and I'm just, I'm excited to share this with people. I'm excited for people to see that you've created something that's so cut and dry, 
with this bright line, <laughs> you know, that it makes it that much easier. Not only that, there's a community of people around it. Um, any tips that you would leave us with? I mean, I'm, we're definitely gonna share more information about your program that you have um, and how to join this community, but I'm really curious, what, what kind of tips would you tell people who are, you know, wanting to lose weight, but kind of unsure of the next steps, especially if they are fairly educated around healthy food and clean food? Um, I, you know, I think, I think knowing where you are on the susceptibility scale, you know, like one is I'm not thinking about food in between meals. My body always tells me when I'm full, I've never binged. I don't even know what that means. And, um, you know, food is not really on my radar screen from that on like one on the low end up to 10 on the high end, which is I'm obsessed about food all the time. My, I'm rarely satisfied when I eat. I often lose control of food when I eat. You know, I, I definitely have experienced binging. You know, if you look at that continuum, knowing where you are on that scale, I think is really the first step because bright line eating is not for everybody. We see people in the mid range or the low end of the susceptibility scale choosing an approach of bright lines mostly as a, as a path of sort of self-empowerment, you know, or they do have 20 or 40 extra pounds to lose. They just want to get rid of them. But if you're really on the higher end of that scale, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, then probably having that bit of information will click into place why it is that all the education in the world really people on the high end of the susceptibility scale tend to be some of the most educated people about nutrition and health and all of that stuff it'll help click in why all that education has not helped with getting free around food obsession, like getting rid of those extra thoughts about what you have or haven't eaten, whether you're on or you're off your plan, whether you can or can't afford to take this bite of food and, um, and losing that excess weight, you know? Like, I think it's just empowering information to have. So that would be the first step I would recommend for people. Perfect, we'll send them a link to the quiz. I can't wait to take it myself. I'm curious. Send me, let me know what you want. I will let you know. I have a feeling it's up there above five. <laughs> just, just based on things. Um, but yeah, that's really cool. Susan, thanks for taking time to talk with us and just really give us a glimpse into your world. I'm, I'm fascinated. It's really, oh, great. Thank you. really great talking with you. Thanks, my dear. Awesome.